Hey everybody, uh, we're about two weeks from uh, the release of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 versus The Suicide Squad, and the numbers aren't nearly as high as I would hope. That being said, I want to say uh, the overall channel numbers, just from the release of that video, are doing fantastic. You guys have honestly done a really great job. You're throwing a lot of likes and comments towards that video, and I really see a change. I just want to say... Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, go ahead and like this video, give me a comment, uh, share, hit that subscribe button, go ahead and hit that bell icon. It all helps me out a lot. Thank you, everyone. Didn't they, uh, the NFL said that they would play the Black National Anthem before the regular national anthem and i was like what even is the black national anthem is it just sirens it, like is, what it, is black <laughs> <laughs> all right i want to clarify this is a big deal this organized chaos video is brought to you by gems art studio gems art studio is an online store that allows access to prints that you can use for most anything obviously as just a picture or as a wallpaper or as a bookmark or anything you can think of. You can find Gems Art Studio at etsy.com slash shop slash Gems Art Studio. This video is also brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you. Not long ago, I went to the Cincinnati Comic Expo and I got some great footage. One of those videos started getting a bit of attention, and it's not the one I expected. It was the Jim Shooter panel, which was something I assumed would only be of interest to huge comic book nerds like me. I started seeing the comments saying they were sent by the Fourth Age. I thought I would check this out. I typed the Fourth Age into the YouTube search bar, and I find this channel. It's got about 10,000 less subs than I do, but his videos are getting way more views than my recent videos. This is a channel on the rise, while my channel is now struggling. So I click on his most recent video at the time, Woke Entertainment vs. Success, a mildly distressing title since I found that typically people who use the word woke have become completely insufferable. I see that the Jim Shooter panel is listed in the info, and I'm hopeful. So I start watching this video, and I'm thinking of posting a comment about how I'm happy they found my video helpful. I notice he never mentions my channel by name. Also, before I start, I just want to say the link is in the description for the original YouTube video where I found this. If you're interested in Jim Shooter, go on over there and listen to the entire thing. It is worth it. Although I have to say, from the channel that I found it on, I don't think the person who runs the channel has anything to do with Comicsgate. So do what you will with that information. It's never organized chaos. It's always this channel. He also says he looked at my channel's content and mentions how it doesn't seem like I'm involved with Comicsgate. And I've never heard of that term before. So I hit Google and did a bit of research. It seems like it's a complex equivalent of Gamergate, of which I'm happy to say I am absolutely not involved with. This is a video of a man sitting on a stage with no pomp or circumstance whatsoever. He looks to be in a small little room talking to a handful of people, so much so that he can hear them, each one of them, that are in front of him. He has no microphone, sitting next to a bunch of chairs in a small room. And this is how one of the comic greats is being treated right now. Uh, he had a whole stage and microphone set up uh, that he could use. He opted out of that to sit down and just talk to the people. I respect that. It wasn't that he didn't have access to a microphone, that he was being disrespected or something like that. He had access to that. Uh, I would actually say, while he was in a smaller room than Ross Marquand, about the same number of people showed up to his panel as showed up to Ross Marquand's panel, to give you an idea. He was asked, if you want to get into comics, where do you start? And here was his answer. If you want to get into comics, where do you start? It's very hard these days. Uh, the big companies don't look at submissions. Um, 
so you, your your choices are there's two things that will cause them to become aware of you. One is exposure, and the other one is success. So if you self-publish and it starts to take off a little bit, then then they want to they want to hear from you. The cheapest way to self-publish is online, obviously. Uh, that works. Uh, so regardless of the subject matter. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact is that's how you do it. You get exposure or you get success and then you have a story to tell and then they want to talk to you. Because no one of the big publishers is ever going to get fired for hiring a John Byrne. But they might get fired for hiring you if you don't work out. So I just want to point out from this statement, how does he say you can get into the comic industry? Well, you put yourself out there into the world and you get either exposure or success. And that's how you get in. Now, I want to contrast that with what has been said at the major Marvel panels, the Women of Marvel panels, at the Comic-Cons for the last number of years. How do they say that you can get into Marvel to actually work in comics? Because this is one of the questions they answer every year. What their answer is, is similar, but vastly different in the end. Their answer is, you need to put yourself out into the world, and then we will come and find you. Now, that's the same thing that Jim Shooter just said, but why would they come and find you? Well, New Marvel says, we will come and find you if you have a unique voice. And what does unique voice mean? Well, unique voice means that you have some intersectional quality with either your race or your religion or some other identity marker that makes sure that you're different from everyone else in the room. That's the moment where I realized what the fuck I'm getting into. That is pure projection right there. Essentially, what the big Marvel panel said and what Jim Shooter said are essentially the same thing. As for the term unique voice, when you're a writer, you're looking for your unique voice. It's the way you write. It's essentially like your writing personality. How do you engage with the audience with your words? Do you write like a technical manual or do you add some flavor to it? Do you add some personality to it? That's what a unique voice is. Now, they might prefer it if you're part of maybe some minority group because that helps with quotas and things like that. Looking at it from a raw business standpoint, they might like that. But that's not what unique voice means. He's purely projecting that. That's when I realized this might be something I need to address. There seems to be many people out there who seem really concerned with the representation of those with less social advantages than they suddenly being a bit more prominent. This ideology never made any sense to me. It would be like if Lex Luthor bought the Daily Planet and fired Clark Kent because Jimmy Olsen was willing to do his job for far less money and Superman then decide his ultimate enemy is Jimmy Olsen. Lois Lane, say hello to Clark Kent. Told you one thing. Oh, Lois Lane, how are you? Remember my dynamite expose on the sex and drug orgies in the senior citizens' home? Remember the senior... Hey, do it. Jimmy Olsen, photographer. But now that I've dipped my toe into the world of Comicsgate, now that I am on the 4th Ages YouTube channel, I decide to do a quick credibility check. Many comic book and movie YouTubers went on a huge string of anti Brie Larson videos. It was so prominent that I almost made a parody Brie Larson video, but never had the time. So I go to his YouTube channel, go to the videos tab, type in Brie Larson, and to his credit, he seems to have nothing strongly against Brie Larson. This is RJ. If you listen to my channel at all, I'll probably shock you a little bit with how I'm going to start today, because I got to start by saying, People need to lay off Brie Larson. Really, honestly, 100% honestly, people need to lay off Brie Larson a little bit. So we're over the first hurdle on that one. So let's take a look at his take on Comicsgate. He has a video exclusively about it that's very early. So let's listen to that. Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about Comicsgate and why it's important and it's actually needed. I would say, more than important, it's needed. It's about a good product. That's what we want, a good product. And we don't want some gatekeeper choosing what is a good product and what isn't. We want the money to choose it. It's all economics. 
we want the money to choose what is good and what isn't. I don't care if your gatekeeper is on the left or on the right. I don't want him in my comic books. Comic book sales are in the gutter. We are actually lucky comic books still exist. The very idea that comic books are trying to expand out to different demographic groups is a 100% logical business decision because their main base isn't supporting them anymore. If their main base can't move enough copies to support them, they need to get an audience from somewhere or get money from somewhere. Those are their two options. And I'll actually go over a bit later which option Marvel's taking. I'm not 100% sure where DC's going. DC, I think, is just trying to widen their, uh, widen their uh, tent. Allow the money to show you where to go. Publish the comics that do well. Cancel the ones that don't. Not necessarily. Following the money does not necessarily make a good product. The Shawshank Redemption famously bombed in movie theaters. Uh, it's a great product. It's their end notes. Okay? Because 20% of the product that you're getting when you buy a DC and Marvel comic is their history. From time since Stan Lee started Marvel Comics, history has been part of the product of an American comic book. And whenever someone tries to strip that history away, they're giving you an inferior product. And they've tried this a number of times, and it's failed Marvel and DC many, many times. Okay? When Marvel tried to reboot in the late 90s, it failed miserably. Why? Because they erased all that history. It was more than just that, but that was one of the big reasons. Okay. The Marvel reboot he's talking about. Heroes Reborn. Yes. It kind of sucked. It was a... It's kind of interesting how the story played out. It was the Onslaught storyline, which starts out really cool and ends really crappy. Um, essentially, this serves as uh, a hard reboot for the Fantastic Four and the Avengers. And, an, and not a reboot at all for Spider-Man and the X-Men. Essentially, a reboot for... What was at their time? Yes, the Avengers were one of their less popular characters at the time. Their less popular but still prominent characters got a little reboot to see if they could get some more interest in them. While the really popular characters of the X-Men and Spider-Man could continue on their own stories. Now, Heroes Reborn sucked. But it was not a complete waste. Because with the Avengers and Fantastic Four off in their own universe, what uh, Kurt Busiek came up with was the idea of the Thunderbolts. What the Thunderbolts were, spoiler for like at least a 20 year old comic at this point. The Thunderbolts were the masters of evil disguised as superheroes, taking the place of the missing superheroes and helping the world to gain the world's trust and attempt to conquer it. And that series was pretty fucking awesome. So yes, Heroes Reborn sucked. But it gave us Thunderbolts, so it wasn't a complete crapshoot. And plus, when the Heroes Reborn failed and the Avengers came back and they end up doing this thing where the memories merge, so like Heroes Reborn was still canon, but all the other stuff was still canon, uh, we end up getting this great crossover conflict between the Thunderbolts and the Avengers. It was just awesome. Kurt Busiek started writing for the Avengers when they returned. Great comic book stuff. So even though the uh, reboot that Marvel tried failed at that time. At the end of the day, it turned out great. Now, some people out there, well, I'm looking at, you know, Ethan Van Skyver right now with his Indiegogo campaign and, and Richard Meyer with his Jawbreakers campaign. You know, even I, I've written a novel which I'm trying to get published, but that's not open to a lot of people. So there's only really two options open to most people if they don't like what's going on with their comics. And that's one, to rage quit, or two, to complain. And I'll tell you right now, I stopped reading comics in 1997 because of Marvel's reboot. So you missed Thunderbolts and that whole thing. That thing was fucking awesome. Yes, the reboot itself sucked, but the end, like, like a year after that reboot, they had some awesome stuff because that reboot happened. So even though the reboot itself sucked, some good stuff came out of it. Because I had a wall full of long boxes. At that time, I think it was around 20. 
which 75% of them were Marvel, and they were suddenly telling me that all of that history that I had collected and gone through so many stores looking for was just worth nothing? No, those comic books are still there. You can still read them. And as I said, uh, eventually that hard reboot they did with those characters turned into a soft reboot because all their memories merged. So uh, I can understand being kind of annoyed initially, but I'll go ahead and say it from my perspective. Uh, I was never into Avengers or Fantastic Four. So when they did Heroes Reborn, I went ahead and, and checked it out, and it was kind of nowhere. But was kind of a, uh, kind of got me interested in checking them out because uh, they had so much history and it seemed daunting, and the fresh reboot seemed like a good way to jump in. Um, and then I didn't like how, that style of uh, how they were taking the characters. But when they did the return, uh, because I had already felt like I was kind of in, like. I felt like I already had some of the history of the characters just by hearing, reading the Reborn stuff. When they did the return, I was pretty much on board for a lot of that for a while. So, initially it didn't work, but then it did. So I said, okay, you're seriously asking me to buy stories that are extremely inferior for more money and you're going to lop off 20% of the product at the same time which is my entire history, and make my wall full of long boxes of Marvel Comics worth nothing to me. Okay, he keeps on going over this, and it's kind of... I don't mean to be rude, but it's kind of like the way a kid thinks about it. Oh, the heroes don't know these things anymore, so therefore that doesn't count. It's almost like saying, uh, because of Christopher Nolan's Batman movies, the Tim Burton ones, we can't watch them anymore. They don't, they don't count. Or because of Ben Affleck's Batman, oh, the Christopher Nolan movies, they don't count anymore. They're still there. You can still read those. They're not gone. A lot of people are still doing this. Marvel is still doing this. They they tried to do this without rebooting the universe by, by giving us these new characters, which they finally tried to get, listen and get rid of, which is like uh, the new female Thor or the new Spider-Man or all of these other characters. And the reason why we're complaining about them is because, no, not because the new Thor is female, not because the new Spider-Man is a man of color. It's because you're chopping off the 20% of the product that we've come to expect for the last, what, 60 years now of Marvel Comics? You're going to take all of that history and just chuck it out the window and say, oh, start again. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Uh, yes. New Spider-Man, Miles Morales. Uh, he took over for Peter Parker when Peter Parker died in the Ultimate Universe. Miles Morales became the new Ultimate Spider-Man. That being said, Ultimate, the Ultimate Universe and the main Marvel timeline are two different universes. So Spider-Man, as played by Peter Parker, and Spider-Man Miles Morales were published at the same time. You can read either one you want. You weren't forced to only read new Spider-Man. I mean, this isn't true of the other characters, but Miles Morales' Spider-Man and Peter Parker's Spider-Man have been, as far as I know, just coexisting. Even when the Ultimate Universe collapsed, he just came to the mainline universe, and now there's two Spider-Mans in the universe. I don't see why that's an issue remotely. But the companies, like I said in one of my other videos, that own Marvel and DC are now so huge, and they have Marvel and DC have this giant pot of money to draw from, their post-sales companies, that I, I was going on in one of my other videos about the fact that they don't care about sales anymore. They don't care if they lose money. Okay, maybe they do care a little bit if they lose money, but at the very least, they don't care enough about losing money to think of it as a complaint anymore. That's because they largely are losing money. The comic book industry, well, the big names, are not really used to sell comic books anymore. And we'll, we'll get into that later. But uh, yeah, uh, comic books as we know it are either just hanging on or losing money. That's why uh, you saying, hey, I'm going to rage quit this, doesn't mean so much to them. I think this is important to talk about 
and something to bring up, which people probably don't think about, about the fact that when you buy a Marvel or DC comic, when you buy something like that, you are purchasing a product that is 20% history. You are purchasing the history of that along with the physical copy. And that's something we need to think about. That's why you have a bunch of long boxes in the corner, right? That's why I do. Oh, God, I can't keep on replying to this. The history is still fucking there. When you buy a comic book, you're not buying history. You're buying that story for the month. That is all a comic book is. That's all it's ever promised to be. That's why there's one-shots. Are you telling me you've never, ever in your history picked up a one-shot or a limited series because it doesn't have history? How long does a series have to run for you to be interested? 100? 200 issues? Will you not pick it up before then? I'm really confused by this. Yes, the history is nice. It's not a requirement. When you pick up a comic book, you're not picking up 20% history. You're picking up that character's story for the month. Because the history is always going to be there. They could do anything they want to these characters. The history, the classic stories you know, will still be there. Because of that, if they chop off the history, and if, even if they do it in the ways that they're trying to do now, which is to take the heroes that we know and love and have a history and turn them into something which is not them at all. I'm looking at Hawkeye right now. Okay. I bought Hawkeye in the Avengers from the 1960s on. And, you know, I bought the Hawkeye miniseries when it came out in the 80s. I know the history of Hawkeye. This guy that they're putting in the comics right now with the name of Hawkeye and calling him Clint, that is not the same character. I should hope not. That character has had 60 years of history. I hope the Hawkeye you're reading now is different than the Hawkeye in 2000. I hope the Hawkeye in 2000 was different than the Hawkeye in 1980. I hope the Hawkeye of 1980 was different than the Hawkeye of 1960, 62, whenever he was introduced. These characters need to change. They stay the same for 60 years. That's fucking boring. So now that I've kind of got an idea where Fourth Age stands on this, time to do a little bit of research and give myself a history lesson. What exactly is Comicsgate? There are many starting points for Comicsgate. There is no real specific catalyst that brought these people together under this banner, but rather numerous events. Here are the two big ones. In 2016, Mockingbird had a cover where she wore a t-shirt that read, Ask Me About My Feminist Agenda. This resulted in a Twitter campaign of harassment against writer Chelsea Kane. Now it's worth noting that all of this harassment appears to be largely deleted from Twitter. It's impossible to find too much. There has been a picture described that was apparently expertly drawn of Mockingbird being graphically raped and beaten, still wearing the shirt all torn up on her. I can't find this either which might be for the best. The next big event. In July of 2017, Flo Steinberg, an independent comics publisher and a former secretary to Stan Lee during his big rise in the 60s while he was in Marvel, died from complications with a brain aneurysm and metastatic lung cancer. In honor of her memory, many of the women working at Marvel at that time went to a milkshake shop and took a selfie together. This went very poorly. This tweet got bombarded with hostile tweets. The least offensive ones calling them fake geek girls and frauds. Doxing was also involved with this, which is outright disgusting. Diving into Comicsgate, two names kept on coming up. Richard Meyer, which we'll bring up a little bit, but the big name that keeps on coming up, Ethan Van Skyer. He used to be an artist for Green Lantern, as well as numerous other stories, but Van Skyver is by far the most brought up and popular co comicsgate figure. He does have a YouTube channel. So let's check this out. Okay, so first thing we're going to do, we're going to go to this YouTube channel. We're going to look under the videos. We're going to do the Brie Larson test. Oh boy, he doesn't do nearly as well as the fourth age, does he? Okay, let's dive into the most popular of these. 
at 400,000 views. LOL, Chris Hemsworth shocked at Brie Larson's stupid ego. Starting great with that title right there. All right, how do you do? It's Comic Artist Pro Secrets, and I am Ethan Van Sciver, 26-year veteran of the comic book industry. World's most charming, elegant, eloquent, and yet humble man. Great big Star Wars fan, trusted member of the media. A lot of people ask me to comment on this situation here. Happy to do so. Refer to another trusted media outlet, The Daily Caller. Totally unbiased, you know? So, understand my pain right now. I sat through this whole goddamn video, and I have to say, not only is this some garbage production quality, this fucking guy has over 100,000 subs and literally just holds a goddamn camera to a goddamn computer screen ranting and pointing his pen at things. And his rant boils down to simply, I don't like Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel. I don't know who the hell uh, gave us Captain Marvel. I'm not really sure. Uh, but uh, at least this iteration of Captain Marvel is pure garbage. This is Carol Danvers, an obscure character that, that did okay, you know, in early Marvel comics. She was okay in the early stuff. But she was dug, uh, dug from the stinky cellar uh, of uh, Marvel comics and elevated to prominence. I don't have an argument against that. You are allowed to dislike that. His critiques, though, include him mocking this photo of her. And her, uh, look at, by the way, the, this is pride. Uh, this, this face right here is pride. If, you know, if we, if we had illustrations of the seven deadly sins, I would not be gluttony. Uh, shush, I wouldn't. Uh, look at this face right here. Oh, look at this. She looks like the defendant. Uh, ugh. No, she looks like the plaintiff on an episode of, uh, Judge Judy. Is it Judge Judy? Cool. We all have shitty photos of ourselves. Especially in the internet age where cameras are all over the fucking place. Anyways, he finally gets the guts of the article when he brings up that Brie Larson wants to be like Tom Cruise and that she wishes to do the majority of her own stunts. Uh, re responding to Helmsworth's stunt comments saying... See, this this is the thing. I did my stunts because I thought that's what everyone did. Let's watch this clip and just see. I mean, you know, we'll find out what your impression of this is. Um, all right, let me see. I did all my stunts. I did, I did my stunts because I thought that that's what everyone did. Uh, and then... Tom, Tom Cruise over here? No, I'm going to be the first me, not the next Tom Cruise. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much. And don't question me again. I am whamming. I'm going to be the first me. Pre okay, cool. I don't care. Anyways, he also points out how Brie Larson had a problem with the lack of people of color in the press pools for her events. The angry white guys uh, that she seems to have a serious problem with. Brie Larson complained publicly that there were too many white males in her press pool and she wanted to see more people of various colors out there as she uh, looked out at, at them and, and singularly looked at them looking at her. Um, she wanted to see more people of color and more, I don't know, disabled people, more LGBTQ people out there. And uh, even if those people didn't particularly want the job of following her around on her press uh, junket for Captain Marvel, she was looking for him anyway. She's tired of seeing Whitey. She's tired. This pre does not go well with crackers. Okay. Cool. She means well. And he also takes a moment to criticize her, saying she looks old. Shared Friday by Entertainment Tonight shows the 29-year-old, by the way, this is like a 45-year-old woman. It's shocking to me that she's only 29. She's got a lot of road miles. There's a lot of kind of just, uh, you know, I don't know, ex-wife about this woman. Uh, a lot of uh, I owe you child support about this woman. Uh, 29 years old. Fuck, dude. Really? Then he mocks her voice and goes to an unflattering picture of her. He then plays the video again. And I just can't get over how he's just hitting play on the computer screen and pointing a fucking camera on it. This guy has over a hundred thousand fucking subs 
and he can't figure out screen capture software? I mean, holy fucking shit. And then he manages to give his prediction for Avengers Endgame, which is completely fucking wrong. Which, him being wrong about something is about as shocking as grass being green. Uh, now here comes Thanos, and we need Brie Larson to come in and just one-punch him and just be so wonderful. So wonderful. Uh, fans won't have to wait much longer to see uh, the next chapter. It's, it's coming out uh, April 26th. We'll see if my prediction is true. Now... I do understand that Brie Larson um, signed seven, I think, was it a seven-picture deal uh, for the Avengers? But that doesn't matter. So did Alden Ehrenreich uh, for Solo. Uh, I doubt he's going to be Han Solo ever again. Uh, what my prediction is for Avengers Endgame is that Brie Larson, as Captain Marvel, will face down Thanos, will beat him uh, a la Superman versus Doomsday when nobody else could, uh, and it will cost her her life. Uh, her powers will get transferred over um, to her girlfriend, uh, Maria Rambo's young daughter, who is now 20 years older. I guess she'll be like 25 years old. Monica Rambo, who played the original Captain... Who Monica Rambo, by the way, was the original Captain Marvel. She is a woman of color. Um, and uh, I think she's going to receive the powers of Captain Marvel and then lead the Avengers uh, franchise into the next... I don't know, the next decade. But none of these characters, most of these characters are not coming back. So, I'm not going to watch any more of Ethan Van Skyer's videos. Sitting through this thing was fucking painful. I will watch, if you really want me to get into a five video, I'll watch a hundred fucking fourth age videos before I watch another one of these fucking pieces of shit. So, avoiding his videos... Good news is, he's done interviews. Yay. In these interviews, he likes to bring up how he's been cancelled, and how being cancelled is like attempted murder. They find people like me, they destroy them, and then they say, don't you be like him. Yeah, you're an uh, example. And that's right. That's what cancel culture is. It's just a series of, uh, you know, executions. And by the way, I really do believe, you know, it's, uh, you know, it is meant. They're hoping that people will kill themselves. This is, uh, this is literally, in my opinion, it's attempted murder. Did you know that if you're successful and will instantly be able to land on your feet, being fired is like attempted murder? Did you know that? And he didn't say accidentally because he says it in two separate interviews. I'm going to say something and you tell me how this hits you. I think this is attempted murder. I think every time this happens, I think it's attempted murder. It was very clearly the point he was trying to get across. And at the end of this, we're going to get to why that's a fucking ridiculous statement. He also, in one of these interviews, decides to defend Warren Ellis as a guy who just liked to sleep with his fans. Uh, they're kicking out they got rid of Warren Ellis, uh, who was considered to be this wizard, this British wizard of comic book writing. This guy was like a rock star. And it turns out Warren Ellis had a whole flock of female fans that he felt free to, uh, you know, um, have sex with at conventions and things like that. Uh, they all got together. He would basically dump them after he was done with them. They all got together and destroyed his whole life. They made a whole wow. website about... You know, we are all speaking with one voice now. We are the victims of Warren Ellis. And I'm like, I think you guys were groupies. I feel like you guys yeah. were probably groupies and you're all of age. You're adults. Sounds like this was all consensual and you chose to be used by a guy who you really admired. Now, in case you're wondering, Ellis has over 60 women accusing him of sexual misconduct. And here's possibly the craziest thing in all. Van Skyver defends Ellis's activities. But you know who doesn't defend Ellis's activities? Ellis himself. Ellis is quoted by the Hollywood Reporter saying, well, I've made some bad choices in my past and I've said a lot of wrong things. Let me be clear. I have never consciously coerced, manipulated, or abused anyone, nor have I ever assaulted anybody. But I was ignorant of where I was operating from at the time. And I should have been clear. And for that reason, I accept 100% responsibility. 
I have always tried to aid and support women in their lives and their careers, but I have hurt many people that I had no intention of hurting. I am culpable. I take responsibility for my mistakes. I will do better. And for that, I apologize. It's also worth pointing out how in the Unsafe Space podcast, he talks about how liberalism is a cult. I think for me, because I didn't realize social justice was functioning as a belief system. Hmm. I didn't think of it like that. It, it is an, it's an ideology. It's even, it's a cult-like ideology, as I said, but that's the way it functioned. It gave me, it gives people a, a, a way of discerning what's good and what's bad. It tells you what, and, and it tries to break it down in this really childish. Yeah. At the beginning of this podcast, he talked about Trump like this. Uh, and uh, yeah, then and, and Trump naturally, uh, because he was our choice. And I started to, I liked Trumpism. There is also a very noteworthy joke in the Chrissy Meyer podcast interview he did. Didn't they, uh, the NFL said that they would play the black national anthem before the regular national anthem. And I was like, what even is the black national anthem? Is it just sirens? It, like is, what? It, is black. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to clarify, this is a big deal. It's not that the joke in and of itself is a big deal. It's simply a dumb joke. But the underlying ideas behind the joke are what the problem is. The whole joke revolves around the idea that black people are criminals. So let's say someone like Chrissy Meyer got into politics. She might do it with the best intent, but in her mind, probably even subconsciously, her brain would be informing her that black people are criminals. And in that position, she could legislate laws that affect black people with that mindset. Now imagine how many people we have in politics right now that might already have that mindset. All of a sudden, the reason why systematic racism exists becomes very clear because very few people would ever admit that they're racist, but in their subconscious, they'll have a racist idea that they don't even fully realize is racist. And that's when a problem comes up. Okay. I'm done with Van Skyver. I cannot watch any more of his stuff. He is insufferable. He is completely up his own fucking ass. Now, the other big figure that comes up less often, but he is prominent, is Richard Meyer, whose YouTube channel was Diversity in Comics and is now called Comics Matter with Ya Boy Zach. Apparently taking on the role of Ya Boy Zach now. I honestly don't care. His raw production quality is slightly better than Band Skyver, but it's essentially the same type of shit. And it's equally insufferable. The most interesting characters are the white men, typically the straight white men, because they can do the most things. They can have the full range of human traits and ideas and ideals and vices and virtues, and black people are black. Here's the deal. All the comic book supporters I found essentially have the same opinion. It all boils down to, I don't like it when people of color or women take over the roles typically held by men. And no matter what their excuse for this is, whether it be history or just, fuck, I don't like it, it always boils down to that basic premise. Now, here's the deal. Remember when Kyle Rayner took over for Hal Jordan as Green Lantern? Remember when Wally West, who was white in the comic books, took over for Barry Allen as The Flash? I remember when that happened, and you know what? There wasn't a big blow up about it. Nobody cared because it was white guys taking over for white guys. This whole movement seems to have spawned really when Jane Foster took over as Thor, when Carol Danvers took over as Captain Marvel, and when Sam Wilson took over as Captain America. I do think there are followers of this movement, possibly like the Fourth Age, who are genuine in their commitment to simply leave characters the way they are without realizing that that ask is impossible. Comic book sales are in the fucking gutter. 
If the New York Times has trouble selling, I assure you, Spider-Man number 507 is doing much worse. So, to keep comic books afloat, Kevin Feige is using comic books to test out ideas for future movies and TV series. If you love comic books, you should be really happy about this. Because the other option is that the comic books simply die. This is the current reality. If you have a brilliant idea on how to keep them afloat, tell Marvel and DC. But right now, being Marvel's best-selling comic book doesn't mean it's necessarily doing well enough to sustain itself. It's probably not. You have to take a look at this as realistically as possible. Yelling at Marvel and DC for trying to expand their audience is useless when their previous audience can no longer sustain them. As for the big leaders of this movement, Richard Meyer and especially Ethan Van Skyver, these are disgusting human beings and outright grifters. Van Skyver is crowdfunding for his Cyberfog series, which is by his admission only selling about 12,000 copies a month, which would put it well into the cancellation range. Yet he doesn't care because the amount he crowdfunds is based entirely on his victim complex. And now, he's a millionaire. If you don't believe me about that, here's him. We raised $538,000 for the first issue of Cyberpunk. Wow. And it went on and on and on wow. and on. And eventually, the first issue of Cyberfrog has raised to date $1.1 million. That's the thing. People aren't giving him money for fucking Cyberfrog. They're giving him money because he's some sort of victim of cancellation. That is just fighting the good fight. But that's not who he is at all. He literally just fundraises, makes a comic book that does piss poor, and takes the extra money and lives the good life. He is taking some of the worst critiques of comic books and combining them with people's real concerns over the industry and selling them as one and the same and making money off these people while truly offering no change in return. Hell, why would he want change? He's making bank on this all the way. He's a parasite to this community. So, let me end on a very clear and definitive statement. If you're a pro comics gate, because you feel like comic books are changing your favorite characters too much, I ask that you really take a look at the past and present of your favorite characters. I love Spider-Man, and I cannot stand the Clone Saga and despise the very idea of One More Day. All comic book characters go through changes in their history. Some will be good, and some will be bad but it's impossible to write for the same character for decades and not have some change. And as time goes by, the good changes will become legendary events like Secret Wars, the Infinity Gauntlet, Dark Phoenix Saga. The bad changes will be forgotten, like Heroes Reborn. So if that's the reason you follow Comicsgate, I just ask that you seriously look at the history. Look at what you're truly fighting for. Ask yourself if you really want to be associated with these people. However, if you're a pro-comics hate person because you have a problem with a black Spider-Man or Captain America or a woman Captain Marvel, then I have one thing to ask of you. Unsubscribe to this channel. I don't want you in this community. They think order and chaos are somehow opposites and try to control what won't be. I used to fuck guys like you in prison. <laughs>